Baptist Independent Baptist Church. It's great to have you this morning. I got a couple of things I want to do this morning before we get started. If you want to find Ezra uh, while I'm talking, that is fantastic. But nevertheless, uh, there is a couple of things I want to go over. We will probably not have any announcements this uh, this morning, just by nature of we uh, want to try to keep our services uh, to a certain length of time. And so we'll be doing some special things this morning during the announcement period, which will be much lengthier uh, than the announcement period itself. And so. I ask you to pray for me. You know that I am almost an 80 to 90 percent expositional preacher, and so whenever I go into a topical, um, I used to be straight topical. When I, it seems as if when you're a baby preacher, that's kind of what you gravitate to. Uh, you have a thought, and you go to the Bible, and you find it, you know. And then um, as you develop, you tend to be a little bit more expositional uh, most of the time. And, and I've turned into a, an expositional preacher just by nature of the fact that I preach three times a week, and so sometimes it's just... It's, it's necessary. Um, so, none of that means anything. No, I'm just rambling. Got a couple of things I'd like to tell you this morning. Uh, I would like you to... So, we're on a podcast schedule for every other week, right? Everybody familiar with that? So, one came out last, this month, last Monday. And one will come out tomorrow. So, we're going to have something pretty special for you. How many of you remember Brother David Summerdorf? Brother David Summerdorf? He's been... Man, I, our church changes so fast. Um, of course, he was here uh, preaching our revival services two years ago now, and he'll be here in uh, Febu- late February, early March. I have to look at the calendar. I think it's late February. Couldn't swear to it. <clears throat> but he'll be here again preaching our winter revival for us again this uh, coming year. <clears throat> but if you haven't heard him, then you have missed out in life, quite frankly. Um, I would say he's my... If I had to go pick a preacher to listen to, of all the preachers I've ever listened to, I would probably pick him first. Okay, um, And so I say that to say this, we have a, a, a special podcast coming out tomorrow and uh, he, he called in and uh, we had him on the podcast. So you won't want to miss that. I, I guarantee you it'll be good. Um, and so please put that on your radar. You say, I don't even know how to get to the podcast. I still have those questions. We have, Austin has put it on the website. So if you go to the church website, uh, there should be a tab or a link. Some, you just have to look through the stuff. Uh, click the little sandwich thing, you know what I'm talking about, the little hamburger symbol, and uh, you'll find it. So if you need to find that, let me know, and we'll help you out with it. Uh, I also wanted to do something this morning that I didn't do last year, is because I realized that we prepped all this stuff, and y'all didn't get to see them. Does that make sense? Uh, these are the awards that we're getting giving out to this, uh, this morning. This one's the Servant of Justice Award. It has the Gray Force patch. We stole that from their website. And uh, Brother Austin designed this and took care of ordering it. And it's a very nice, uh, very nice award. It's uh, got like a resin, supposed to be like a faux stone, if you will, but resin back. And uh, it has a glass front, and I'm got to tighten that up. And then it says, it's presented to Gray Forest Police Department from the Lotus Independent Baptist Church, has the date on it. And then it has Romans 13, 3 through 4, which is the for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the pr- power? And so it's the whole verse. I just thought you would be interested in seeing that. Because y'all didn't get to see it last year. I just handed it to him. And uh, it's, really, it's really nice. Now, I will tell you this. The awards that we presented to uh, the last two uh, departments are pro- very prominently displayed, by the way. If you go down to the police department in Holotus, it is in their lobby. I think it's the only one that's in their lobby. And then uh, the fire department, it's in their lobby as well. It's pretty fr- No, it's in there. It's inside the firehouse, but it's pretty prominent. And so I just wanted to help you with that. And, of course, this is the one we're going to give to ESD-8. If you don't know what ESD is, it's Emergency Service District. It's basically a really large county district uh, fire and EMS service. And so um, this is what we're giving to them. We call it the Faithful Watchman Award. Same thing. And so we'll be handing these out. I thought you would appreciate seeing these. Uh, very nice. Very nice. And so... Uh, we tried our best not to give them something cheesy. How's that? Um, I, I, you know, you, you, if you want to honor somebody, then don't give them something unhonorable. How's that? Uh, and so we tried to make sure that it was worth, worth their while, and so I, I appreciate that. Of course, th- these things cost money, but I think that it's a worthwhile investment into, into somebody's eternity. Don't you see where I'm going? Uh, the Bible verse that says give honor to where honor is due is a great principle to, to be able to apply. That particular verse, by the way, is from... Yes, Miss. Uh, it was, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, it expanded greatly to the district that it is. 
And uh, if you're not familiar, I had somebody ask me yesterday, uh, that was, who was I talking to? Where are you at, brother? Oh, I don't know where he went. Uh, he must be outside doing usher duty or something. Oh, there you are, Dan. I'm right here. Why in the world would you be a terrible Baptist and sit in a wrong place? I'm looking, and there is no Dan. <laughs> they, yeah, you can't do that. It's a Baptist church. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's like, well, why did you take my last two, cha- my last two rows? <laughs> we'll get into Sunday school in a minute. Y'all don't mind this, do you? Brother Dan and I were at, talking yesterday, and uh, we were, he was like, where is Great Forest? This light right here? Take a left, drive for like 30 seconds, and you're in Great Forest. <laughs> yeah, you'll find Great Forest. Like, literally, we could spit to them, okay? I know that might be a little crass, but like, it is that close. You and I could walk, everyone in this room, even though you have mobility issues, could walk to Great Forest. Um, it's, it is that close, and so, what's that? Yeah, speed through there, you'll find out real quick after you're in Great Forest. That's no joke, actually. So we want to honor them, to, uh, and of course, uh, both Holotus and Great Forest have mutual aid agreements, so you, you could find yourself in Holotus in a crash or a massive situation and find yourself with a Great Forest or ESD uh, personnel at your scene because the, they're, they're both smaller departments and so they'll have these mutual aids so that if there's a, an incident where uh, Holotus is tied up or vice versa then they'll respond to one another's calls and so we want to honor them. We could very easily find ourselves with an, with an ESD-8 ambulance or fire truck here at the, at the church uh, and so I, I think that's pretty interesting. Sportsman retreat is coming up, so if you're a uh, man of the church, remember that this is, this, is your, this is something you need to register on your own. That information may or may not be back there on that table because we probably tried to clean it up the best we could for uh, guests. But if you need that information, I have some up here. Uh, we'll be going to Lake Tectoma uh, Baptist Youth Camp. Of course, it's not going to have any youth there. If you're taking your young boys, that's perfectly fine, but you need to get with James uh, or, or send them a note. And I think that you, if you take your young boys, so anybody under 18, I think you have to uh, take care of your own lodging. Uh, and that is mostly because of an insurance thing that they have, that their insurance only covers uh, kids there if there's counseling and kid activity kind of thing. And so that's, that's the way that is. Uh, and that, that's from last year's information, so you might want to double check with that. Missions conference is coming up second week of October. I want you to make sure you get that on your radar. And then don't forget about our anniversary services next week. And if you signed up to help us with that, um, Please try to make sure you take care of it, obviously. It's a lot. We got a lot going on, don't we? It's a good sign. Uh, I ask you to pray for some things. Of course, uh, I'll, be in, uh, I'll be working on budgets and stuff like that for next year. And, uh, and in case you hadn't noticed, we are getting close to being out of room again. And so I want you to be in prayer that God would show himself uh, his will to be uh, shown very clearly in, in that area. Because I'm praying, listen, I'm praying to reach people. And if you reach people, then you fill up pews. And if you fill up pews and you don't have any more pews to fill, you have a problem. Does that make sense? And so it's, it's a good problem to have, yes. And it's also an extremely nerve-wracking problem to have as the pastor. So just pray that God would uh, grant wisdom in that area. Last thing before we move on to Ezra. Last thing. This is, and I left this last for a reason. Uh, expectation for today. One, I would want you to be aware of the traffic pattern we're going to have after the service so that you can kind of be mulling over it. After the service, we're going to exit. I'm going to send the nursery, uh, those parents who, uh, who have kids in the nursery, out the doors and then out the, out, out the doors and you may go get your kids out of the nursery. I would pref- uh, I, 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 I'd pref- not, prefer is not the right word. I'm asking you to go out the nursery hallway door and come back through the double doors that lead into the fellowship hall, the one that we all use for the front door, um, because I'm trying to keep traffic one way, best I can. If you have kids in junior church this morning, I'm going to dismiss you right after that to get your junior church kids and then exit out that single door down that nursery junior church hallway and come back in the double doors. For the rest of us who don't have anybody in nursery and don't have anybody in junior church, I'm going to ask you to exit, take a right, leave the front doors, walk the hall the, the, the walkway to the double doors and go in the double doors. That way we don't have a lot of where's the line, here's the line, back and forth kind of stuff. And we will dismiss our guests first. Uh, and then we will uh, move on to ourselves, if you don't mind. Please walk through with your kids if you can. If your kids are small, they don't know what they're doing, if they might spill a plate or something like that, please walk through the line with your kids. I need your help, though. Uh, so that's the traffic pattern. Everybody understands that, though? That's pretty simple. Okay, good. 
uh, I need your help with some things. Uh, there's only one of me, and I struggle, quite frankly, just about every Sunday morning when we have visitors to balance uh, trying to speak to you, you all and then try to speak to our visitors and try to spread myself. I really struggle with this just about every service, to be honest. And uh, with the level of extra guests we're going to have, there's no way, absolutely zero, oper there's no way I'm going to be able to do it all. Does that make sense? And so this is one of those moments where the church is, we've got our, my, my expectation for you is this. Don't talk to your friends at church, but very minimally. We, we'll be here tonight. You'll see everybody again tonight. But this morning, let's, let's do our due diligence to be as welcoming as possible and, um, and to understand that we must be about the Father's business. And what is it? Somebody help me out. To, the Father's business is what? To seek and save that which is lost. Yeah. And so, of course, we can't save anybody. We can certainly seek them out and point them to the, to the Savior. And so remember that this morning. There will be a lot of people here who don't know Christ as their Savior, or they're very far from the Lord, and they, they, need, they need pointed back or pointed to. And so help us with that. I'm not telling you to beat people upside the head with the Bible and tell them they're going to hell, but I am telling you to take interest in them, genuine interest, and show that you care. That's what the today is about, sharing the love of Christ with our uh, fellow brother and sister in humanity, I suppose, not in Christ. It's a lot. Let's get into Ezra. <clears throat> Ezra chapter number two is a genealogy, but before we get into that, we're going to just kind of close down chapter one. I don't think I fully developed this five through 11 uh, too much last week, and if my memory serves me correct. So let's go into this. I ask you to pr let's pray, and then we'll read, because I feel like I've talked too much, or I've taken 15 minutes up just kind of prepping you, and, and I want to make sure that we get this uh, taken care of this morning. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming to you and to be able to come to your word and to be able to learn some things. And Lord, the book of Ezra has been a rich study for me, Lord, and I know that it's certainly been a wonderful blessing to those here this morning already, and I pray that it continue to be so. Lord, as we dive into the word of God this morning, we know that it won't return void. We, we, we know that. You said that. But Lord, we look for the richness that we can get out of it, Lord, to be able to apply to our life and to deepen our understanding of the rest of Scripture. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You find in Ezra chapter number one, uh, we find in the first four verses, really the return decree of Cyrus, uh, king of Persia. Now, remember that this is uh, the same Cyrus that was declared in uh, Isaiah, I believe, chapter 44, if I'm not mistaken, that he was, he was named by name over 100 years before he was ever born. Incredible, incredible. Uh, by the way, he's also in Jeremiah, um, prophecy of Jeremiah, oh, a hundred years before he's born as well. Just an incredible thing. And then you'll find his, um, the return becomes evident in verse number five. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. God stirs the hearts of the Jewish people to return. However, this passage only mentions three tribes. You notice that? And which ones are they? We, we see them, right? Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the nation of Israel, um, that there are, is a great number of people today who believe that there was not a full return of the Israelites, all 12 tribes, into Israel. And so they'll refer to the lost tribes of Israel. Most of them will say the lost 10 tribes, but obviously, if they're Levites to return, that's three, three, 12 minus three is Already they don't know how to count, so I don't know that I would trust those kind of opinions, right? But they'll refer to the lost ten tribes of Israel and, and, and realistically three returns, so that would only have been nine anyway. Has anybody heard about the lost ten tribes of Israel? Yeah, okay. It's a, pr it's a pretty prominent and real thing. Listen, you'll run into people in the wild if you have too many conversations too long uh, and you start talking about Bible things instead of stuff that doesn't matter like the weather and sports. Um, you will find that you will eventually run into somebody who believes in the lost tribes of Israel. Is there, no, nobody's ever had that conversation with anybody before? You must not have talked to very many Mormon people. Uh, there was once uh, the Worldwide Church or something. You may remember that? That's, it's kind of died out, but it was big in the 80s and 90s. Uh, they believed in that. And <clears throat> recently I've been re re listening after a bunch of archaeology uh, uh, kind of stuff, and they've been talking about the lost tribes of Israel, and I thought, who in the world has put this in their mind. 
and they point to this verse. A lot of times they'll point to this verse because look at it, if you will, with me. It says in verse number 5, Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin, the priests and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. A couple of things. Uh, if you take the scripture and you privately interpret, you will come up with some crazy um, nonsense. Now, what, you, what do I mean by private interpretation? What does Peter mean by private interpretation? Obviously, God is the one who wrote it. But we find in First Peter that no portion of Scripture is of private interpretation, right? So you've heard me say this more than once. Regularly I say this, but what does that mean? Taking it out of context. Did you say that, Lily? Was that you? Okay, you got to speak up. I got hard hearing. Too many radios. <clears throat> um, yes. So to take all the scripture is a, a culmination, right, of God's words throughout time. And, and if you take a piece out of it and then you privately interpret it, a meaning apart from the rest of scripture, that's a private interpretation. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've heard in my life and recently, and uh, recently I hear it too, that people talk about, well, that's what that means for you. And, and so they've... they've privately interpreted this passage <laughs> and made a different interpretation of what that means. So it's not that I get a, a private interpretation for me and you get one for you. It means that the verse is taken by itself. Hence the reason why I am so, I major so much on context. Not just the passage itself, but the scripture. What does the scripture say? And so if you find this passage, it will lead you to believe that there were only three tribes that went back. However, a careful consideration of the verse will help you understand that that may or may not be true and may not be self-evident from this passage either. Because it says, Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah, Benjamin, and the priests, and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised up. So this with them, these them, is unnamed, and we have no idea who they are. Everybody following that? Another thing that is worrisome to those who uh, worrisome to those who believe this uh, uh, that it was only uh, Judah and Benjamin, because that's what they'll say, even though they, they they leave out Levi, obviously. But those who say that only two tribes or only three tribes went back during the restoration of Israel is they'll they'll further reference chapter two, which is. It's a, it's a genealogy, it's a census, if you will, of all those people who returned. And in that census, you won't find other tribes. You won't find other tribes. Why do you believe that that might be relevant, that God would give us, obviously this is a census, right, of the people who came back, but this census in chapter number three is not thousands. So it's already missing. And by missing, I don't mean incomplete. Does that make sense? I don't mean that God gave us something incomplete. It means that this census is relevant to something important. And that anybody whose name is not mentioned in here is not relevant to the purpose of the genealogical record. So God put genealogies in Scripture for a reason, did he not? Because all Scripture is, is uh, profitable, right? For instruction, doctrine, and reproof. And so if it's all profitable for something, why are the genealogies present? Why are these censuses present? It does. God made some promises to, to Adam. Did he not? And the promise to Adam was what? A savior. God made some promises to whom? Abraham. And what did he promise Abraham? A great nation whom the Savior would come from, the Messiah would come from. God made some great promises to Abraham, who had a descendant named David, who God again made some very clear promises to about the Savior. Are we following this? And what was the promise to David? That his throne would be established forever and the Messiah would sit on it and reign forever. Okay? Now, for God to be true and every man a liar, God would need to record an unbroken line 
from Adam to Christ, from Adam to Abraham, from Abraham to David, and from David to Christ. It would need, or else God would not be able to be proved right. Not that God needs to be proved right, but he would establish that and give you the evidence for what reason? Why would he codify that in Scripture? Y'all didn't know you were going to have to think this morning. It's for me and you, right? So it's for our. It's so we we learn some. So if if the Bible is the revelation of God, like a, a special revelation of who God is, and if you didn't listen to last week's podcast, I would encourage you to do so. I'm really not trying to plug it that much. I'm just it just happens to go along with what I'm saying. Like if it's a benefit to you, it's great. If it's not a benefit to you, that's great too. But the podcast last week we talked about the difference between general revelation, which is Stuff around you tells you stuff about God. It, it, it generally reveals God, but it doesn't necessarily tell you specific things about him in the sense of who he is, okay? And then special revelation, i.e. the Bible, uh, is, is something that gives you God. This is how you can know God, not just know about him. Does that make sense? Um, and I used, in that podcast, I used the illustration of my office. If everybody, if somebody was to walk in here, never knew who I was at all and walked into my office, the surrounding of where I am and where I live and where I work would tell you a lot about me, but you wouldn't know me. Does that make sense? You would, it would find out a massive... You probably have a lot of information if you paid attention, if you walked into my office and you just looked around, right? You would know that instantly that I'm a, I'm a father because uh, I got my pictures of my girls up there uh, and there's context for some of that. You know, you'd instantly know that I was in policing profession. You'd know that I was a pastor. I got an ordination certificate on the wall. You see what I'm saying? You would instantly know that I love to read. There's tons of books in there, or at least that I want you to believe I <laughs> love to read. Uh, they're all decorations, yeah. Um, you, you, know, you just know some things about me, right? You would eventually be able to tie some things about me. And that, that's what we get from creation. And then we get what do we know about God uh, personally. We can personally know him greater through his word because this is a special revelation revealing who he is. That means the genealogy reveals to us something about God. It shows his faithfulness. It shows that he does what he says. It shows that he comes through for his people. It shows that even when you're dead in God, God is still fulfilling his promises to you. David's dead, and he's still fulfilling his promises to David. Does that make sense? I know David is in heaven, with Abraham's bosom. But you see where I'm going? God's still fulfilling his promises, and he still will. There will be a throne. Jesus Christ sits on literally and reigns over the world from David's throne forever. It will happen. And we, since we know that God has done this, we can see it again. By the way, you'll find that uh, Zerubbabel, the man that we find here uh, in chapter number one, whose name is Shesh Bazar, you'll find him again in, in chapter 11, I believe. Uh, it's just his, it's his Persian name for Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is the great grandson of Jehoiakim. So Jehoiakim was the king that was carried away captive in the first Babylonian conquest, okay, in, in the southern kingdom. And then his brother was put on the throne. Somebody help me out. Somebody. His brother was put on the throne. And then uh, his brother decided several years later to rebel against Babylon. And so, well, the Babylonian conquest came back, the war machine came back, and they killed all of, I can't remember what the name of that king was off the top of my head. They killed all his sons in front of his eyes, put his eyes out, and took him to Babylon. So the last king of Israel died with all his sons. Now that establishes a broken line, right? But who's the real king of Israel? Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim lived out his life in Babylon and had children. And his children had children. And his grandson returns to be the governor of Israel which is very interesting. Um, you say, how do you, why would you say that Jehoiakim's the actual legitimate king of Israel, not this other guy whose sons were killed and his eyes were put out and died? Big Zedekiah, thank you. It is Zedekiah. Thank you, Miss, uh, Miss Redout. Um, I just didn't write it in my notes and I forgot. And I'm like, who, I, I should have, I'm sorry. Miss Sharon, am I going too fast? Okay. Uh, so Zedekiah, is not the king of Israel, even though he was, he was placed king of Israel by heathens. He's a puppet king. You understand that, right? Like he, he is not the true king of Israel. He's a puppet king, a regent, if you will, 
uh, and a, in a, under a vassal state of Israel. Jehoiakim is still king. And by the way, there are Persian documents that were found in Babylon. Um, they were ration tablets, if you will, ration tablets that have been recently, they were recently found about 100 years ago, uh, pre-World War I. And so they found these pre-World War I ration tablets in Babylon, and they literally have, they're in dis on display in Germany right now, they literally have Jehoiakim's name on them, and it talks about the rations that he received from Babylonian crown. And his sons. And it says King Jehoiakim. So even the Babylonians recognized him as the king. And he lived out his days in, in uh, Babylonian captivity. That unbroken line is given to us here where we find now, we find um, Zerubbabel mentioned, and we find the elders of Judah, and we also find Joshua, who ends up being, it's recorded Jeshua um, in like verse number 36. Uh, we find that because Aaron was perpetually given the, the, the high priesthood. And so God's still per giving these things out. So when you read genealogies in Scripture, please don't let your eyes glass over. It's hard, I know. But understand that they're there for a very important reason, an incredibly important reason. Uh, matter of fact, they're, they're so poor, important that two of the Gospels begin with genealogies, and they're very distinct and different and very purposeful. Um, and so don't do that. So back to our original conversation, right? We have this genealogy, and really, what's the purpose of these, this genealogy? To establish the faithfulness of God, and it really focuses and narrows on the rulers, and it focuses on those who will be in the line of Christ. It'll focus on those who are in the line of the high priesthood. Everybody following that? Okay. And so, um, beyond that, before we get, we get back to verse number 5, and we find that they, were, they, were, they went together with all those whose spirit God had stirred, raised up, but there's no reason to record them because they're not relevant to what God's trying to give us in Ezra. You say, well, how do you know that, um, that some of the other people came back? Well, I'll tell you that you could read a couple of things, but um, we just don't have time to go into it all together. But we do know. Let's go to Second Chronicles for a minute. So Ezra wrote this as well, uh, Second Chronicles chapter number 11. I, I kind of hesitate to spend so much term, time on the, the migration back and the lost tribes and stuff like that, but I think it'll be relevant here in a minute. I'm, I'm trying not to take up too much. This is going to be basically this morning's Sunday school. Uh, verse number 13 of chapter 11 says, And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. What basically you have is when Rehoboam took over, there, had, there was a civil war, okay? Um, and when Rehoboam took over, he was the son of Solomon, he caused a civil war because he was foolish and did not listen to the elders. Uh, and, and so he, he did what was wrong, obviously. And there was a civil war, and the northern kingdom came to be. And so when the northern kingdom came to be, there became a calf that was set up, a, a golden calf and a false religion. And it, was, it was named Jehovah. Uh, and a new, a new temple, if you will, was erected in Samaria. And they began to worship because the, the new king of Israel did not want um, did not want his people returning down to Jerusalem to worship because he's afraid that their hearts would, uh, would be stirred up. And so in verse number 13, the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. Who, where are they resorting to? They're resorting to uh, Jerusalem. And he ordained them priests for the high places and for the, I'm sorry, uh, to Samaria. And ordained them places, uh, priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice in the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, uh, strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. What you'll find here is that when there was this golden calf religion set up in the name of Jehovah, that there was a, there was a migration of people who left Israel to go into Judah because they were not going to live in a land uh, that was in idolatry. They still went down there to worship, and, and presumably many of them stayed. You'll find that that means that there were those who were of the northern tribes that were carried away captive, no doubt, or their descendants in exile, in the Babylonian exile. 
The other thing I'd want you to read, you say, well, that's not really that great of the proof. No, it's, it's really not, but that's the first one that I have. I'm just giving it to you in order. Let's go to uh, Mark, Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter number 4. You say, how do you know that they came back? Um, I wouldn't tell you if I didn't know. I would tell you it's an opinion. You could throw it in the trash. You know that to be true, right? So we know that the, the, the 12 tribes returned. You say that all of them returned? No, of course not every single Jewish person returned to the land of Israel. But all the tribes of Israel were represented in the people who returned. Does that make sense? Um, of course not everybody returned. That's, the Bible is very clear about that. However, in verse number 13 of Matthew chapter number 4, I think I'm in the right place. Uh, yes. And leaving Nazareth, she came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of what? Why would he say that? Those are two tribes of Israel. Why would he say that? Because those people are living there. Uh, and there's a reason why they're living there, because that's, that's just their historic home. And so they're going back uh, to where their historic home is. Look at verse number 15. And the land of Zebulun, and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Gal Gal uh, Galilee, of the Gentiles. And so here we, we find it again, this reference to Zebulun and Naphtali. Um, and of course, it's, it's Greek names of them. Let's move on uh, to Luke chapter number 2. So we find references to these tribes here, those two tribes there. Let's go to Luke chapter number 2. And you'll find in verse number 36. Now, I'm building a case here. I want you to see uh, that if you come across this, that uh, this is blatantly uh, false, okay? Verse number 36, and there was one, Anna, a prophetess of the daughter of, did I tell you what chapter? 236. So one, Anna, prophetess of, a prophetess, the daughter of Penelope, of the tribe of what? Now, I know it's spelt differently, but that's Asher. Are you following me? Okay. Where is she living right now? Jerusalem. And she's not of the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, or Levi. She's from a different tribe that was not recorded to us in Esther because it was, oh yeah, and some more of the people. Right? But the, this, this is not relevant to the narrative, and so God doesn't put it in. The narrative of Ezra. Does that make sense? Okay, let's con continue on, and let's find another passage I want to point out to you. Acts 26. In case you're, this is, my, this is the nail in the, uh, in the coffin, so to speak, of the argument for the 12, the 10 lost tribes, in my opinion. In Acts chapter number 26, uh, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand, his, the hand and answered for himself. And then he begins to tell King Agrippa about the narrative of, um, of the gospel. And he begins, uh, he begins in the days of Moses and the prophets and all those things. And he gets down to verse number 7, though, and he says, Unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews." Now, you, you may not, this is why I said that you cannot take a portion of Scripture and privately interpret it, and that's an incredibly difficult thing to do unless you're going to be a serious student of Scripture. Because verse by ver, ver, these verses that span quite, quite about a distance if between, uh, between chapters, times, and books, and things like that, they correlate to each other. You say, how is this important? Paul says that right now they're hoping for a Messiah that already came. And who's hoping? All the 12 tribes. They're not lost. The, all 12 tribes, of which he's being accused, which when he was accused in Jerusalem, that means representatives of 12 tribes of Israel were present during that speech that he gave, that he was uh, a, a riot that was accosted in the Roman centurion, had to grab, rescue him, and take him to Fort Antonio. Y'all following that? Anybody confused with this yet? Are you seeing it? My point is this. All 12 tribes are there. Now, you say, why would you spend so much time on a Sunday morning on something like that? Well, let me, let me explain to you something. Two false teachings are based 
great false teachings that we've seen recently in modern times are based on a supposed lost tribes of Israel who've never returned uh, to Israel. Uh, there is the teaching of well, the, the British uh, colonialism, I guess, is the best way to put it. And uh, boy, I tell you, the, the news was just, I, I just kind of looked at the headlines this morning. I'll, I'll, let, me, let me carry on a rant for a minute. I got to chase this rabbit because I don't want to do it later. Crystal and I were talking about September 11th a couple of days ago, and we were saying, I wonder how long it'll be before our nation forgets. Even though they say never forget, they will forget. I said, that's a good point, because I, I we were recording the podcast for tomorrow, and interestingly enough, I was, Austin was obviously involved in it. He's 23. He doesn't even remember. He was too young. You know? And so that means our early, our early adults came or they barely, if they do, it's flashes and vague. You know, they're three, four, five years old. Uh, I mean, I was an early, I was middle teens, so 15, 16, something like that. And I'm 36. So there's, we're beginning to age out those who are affected. It's just going to be a few more decades and nobody's going to care. I know that sounds sad and you don't want to hear it, but if we don't do something very clearly to set up some stones so that our children go, what mean these stones? You see what I'm saying? It'll just die off and we'll forget. And so I, this morning, decided purposely I was going to look at the headlines of all the, the major news outlets, you know, the ABCs, the MSNBCs, the CNNs, the Foxes. I, I just wanted to look and see. What, and, and so I looked at the four, you know, the four that everybody goes to, uh, that you see at the news and all that stuff. I didn't bother with all the side ones. I just wanted to see what the four major main, okay, so uh, Fox had prominently remembering 9-11. They had all kinds of stuff. Um, ABC had nothing about it at all. Nothing. Uh, not at least on the front page. You know, I wasn't going to dig. I just wanted to see. MSNBC had their first article was about the horrors of colonialism under Queen Elizabeth II. I was d appalled and disgusted. And then, um, and it doesn't matter what you think about all that. I just thought, really, we're going to use the death of this lady to advance a liberal narrative again. I just thought it was crazy. Um, especially on 9-11 of all days. It's MSNBC. It's not even like it's a foreign, it's an American news company, you know, like, really? And then, um, and then CNN gave kind of a lip service to it. First article, though, I will tell them that. My point is, is that we're losing that, right? Um, and I don't remember what I was talking, oh, that was the other, that, that's how that ties in. I was, I was, because the British, the British colonial thing, the, the Worldwide Church of God and some other people, uh, you say, who's the Worldwide Church of God? I think they're almost extinct at this point. I don't know, to be honest with you, but that used to be a big thing. Um, and a lot of other people were teaching that the lost tribes of Israel were actually, they, they were never returned and they became the modern English people. You say, listen, it's a horrible place to, you start going down that way and you're going to end up being a Nazi. You see where I'm going? You, you can't do that. That has been taught. And so the other side of that is the Mormon believed the Native Americans were the descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. They, they literally, that's in the Book of Mormon. That's no good. It's a clear false doctrine. Uh, and, and by the way, that's the reason why we have the Book of Mormon, because God spoke to them, but we didn't know about it because we were across the ocean. Does that make sense? And so that's, that is a key, pivotal, core, foundational doctrine for them, because without it, it all crumbles. Does that make sense? Um, my point is this. We are, this, is more, this is just as much an exercise in how to study your Bible, and we try to do this a lot in Sunday school, in case you had not noticed, as it is to help hedge you against the doctrine. And I know that probably the vast majority of you have never once thought about this doctrine uh, or its false doctrine, and you didn't think it was that relevant. But you see how that everything is relevant. There's, there's nothing unimportant in Scripture. Because a major world religion today in America has been established on a falsehood based upon Ezra. Isn't that insane? It's, in, it's incredible, isn't it? And so I want to encourage you with that. Uh, I'm running out of time pretty quick. Let's see. God stirs up the hearts of Jewish people, 6 through 11. Uh, 
to return, of course, to rebuild the, uh, to rebuild the temple. And he also stirs the heart of Cyrus um, to return the captured vessels. An incredible amount of wealth was returned back to Israel uh, during this time. And I want you to make sure that you note that Shesh, Shesh, Shesh uh in Ezra 1 and chapter number 11 uh, is just another name for Azubrabal. And so then we get to chapter number 2, which I am not about to try to butcher these guys' names in chapter number 2. I'm just not going to do it. Uh, we could read it together, to, but, but let me just tell you that it's a census of the returnees. It, Ezra carefully records, as an historian, he carefully records the genealogies of all these people who are coming back to the nation of Israel of Providence. Uh, and then it's 42,360 Jewish people who returned to the land under the first wave. Remember that Ezra is not present, and this is 50 years before uh, the the time that Ezra shows up in chapter number seven, seven. And so we'll get into the foundation of the temple and the building of the project uh, in chapter number three next week. I hope that that was an encouragement to you. Did y'all enjoy the? I hope y'all enjoyed that. The lost tribes of Israel. Uh, if you've never heard that before, then there you go. It's a real thing. It's a pretty prominent thing, and so a lot of there are some major doctrines based upon that. Uh, it's all obviously false, and I hope that you saw as we travel through Scripture that if you take the verse out of context or out of the rest of Scripture, sure, you could come up with that, but you'd have to, you have to demolish other, you have to do that at the expense of other places of Scripture. Everybody gets that? So you can't do that, and it's not, it's not, uh, it's not the right way to biblically interpret. So let's go, Lord, in prayer. Thank God for everything he's done for us, and let's pray that God would do something wonderful this morning. Father, we thank you for the privilege of uh, being able to be in your house this morning. I thank you for this time that we spent in the Bible, Lord, being able to learn and to be able to understand the truths of Scripture. I pray you'd help us to be diligent students, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.